Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our panel on the current challenges and future applications of IoT in the airport environment. Uh, my name is Itai Hayut, and besides moderating this panel, uh, I am the CEO of Hupo. It's an Israeli startup uh, that helps logistic companies improve complex logistics operations using our low power tracking and analytics solution. Uh, during the course of the next hour, our dear panelists will be discussing different aspects of IoT applications in the aviation industry. And not surprising to anyone, we will also tackle both pre and post COVID-19 topics. Uh, we will st soon start with short introductions of each panelist. Uh, and in the last 20 minutes of the session, we will dedicate the time for questions coming from the audience. So please post your questions in the meantime on the Q&A chat box that you can find below the screen uh, so that our panelists can reply throughout the presentation. And if time will allow at the end, I'll also ask you to open your mics and speak up the question. So uh, with no further ado, uh, let's start with short introductions. Uh, we're gonna start with Florian. Florian Egenschwiller is the managing director of Exovis uh, Airport the leading provider of passenger flow management systems for airports. Uh, he previously spent many years in the ground handling uh, industry. I personally know Florian since he was uh, the head of innovation at Swissport. Uh, and here's a fun fact that no one knew. Before Florian was even allowed to work at airports, he used to spend his afternoons and weekends at airport fences taking photographs of aircraft. Uh, now, if you're thinking whether this is true or not, so. These photos are still available on airliners.net and believe it or not, they have gathered close to half a million views. Now, when Florian told me that I didn't believe him, so I went on airliners.net and as you can see on the screen behind me, this is actually a photograph with tens of thousands of views photographed by Florian. Uh, Florian, the Zoom stage is all yours. Thanks a lot, Itzai. Uh, well done uh, with your research. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm with a company called Zovis. We're a technology company based out of Bern, Switzerland, where we help airports manage all kinds of aspects of people flow. Over the next couple of minutes, I'll quickly run you through how our solution looks like, how it works, and how it's being used by airports today. In the interest of time, I'll dive straight into the main dashboard a user would see when they log in. On the left-hand side, they would have all the areas where the solution is installed. In this case here, we're now looking at a large immigration hall in Dubai Airport in the Middle East. Each dot that you see here, and by the way, this is time-lapse, each dot here represents a person, and the yellow dots, uh, sorry, the red dots are bubbles here. They uh, represent people waiting in line for the regular uh, uh, immigration. You can see there's now currently a wait time of 24 minutes with close to 400 and uh, close to 400 guests waiting. The blue dots represent a different queue. In this case, we've set it up for the biometric e-gates. You then have stats like how did wait time and predicted wait time evolve over the last couple of hours? How long was the queue in terms of people waiting? And then uh, for this particular customer, we set up additional steps such as which was the hourly throughput of each individual immigration gate. How does it work under the hood? Uh, we have our own um, hardware, our own 3D optical sensors. They are mounted in the ceiling and they are then complemented by our powerful software suite that visualizes and makes sense of the data. How do the sensors work? That's probably the more interesting part. 3D optical sensor, sensors perceive the world through, a, uh, through depth perception, and then the footage is directly processed on the sensor to recognize uh, where are people, and these people are then on the sensor transformed into the dots or bubbles you saw in the clip just earlier, and then the only thing leaving the sensor is the position data of these the bubbles or dots. So no personally identifiable information is uh, recorded or ever leaves the sensor. In order for us to cover large areas such as check-in uh, halls, we have what we call multi-sensor technology where we can virtually stitch together multiple of these sensors. So there's always a small overlap and then a bubble can be handed over from one sensor to, to the next for a seamless tracking of a large space. Today, 
close to 80 airports have this uh, system in live operation and it's being used anywhere from the, the largest hubs of the world like Sydney, Doha, Frankfurt or Atlanta, all the way down to smaller airports with as few as half a million passengers a year. And the great thing about it is that it's very scalable. So even though some air, most airports start in an area like security, the same infrastructure, the same hardware, the same solution can be, then be used to expand into check-in, into retail, taxi ranks, or even bathrooms and other uh, passenger touch points. How do airports use it? Uh, a lot of the use cases are uh, within the area of operations control and situational awareness. So giving the guys in the ops control center, the floor walkers on the terminal floor, the data and the insights to open up and clo close checkpoints, to load balance between different checkpoints, and at the end of the day, to make sure service level agreements are neither over nor underachieved. A lot of airports also focus very much on the passenger experience. So for me as a passenger, it makes a huge difference when I see a long line, whether I'm freaking out about missing my flight, especially inexperienced travelers, or whether I see, okay, there's gonna be a 12 minute wait, I'm safe. Um, and coincidentally, those more relaxed passengers then also tend to spend more in retail areas. Just touching very briefly about COVID-19, and I'm sure we're gonna talk about it more later on. Uh, we're helping airports uh, now to cope, for example, with increased cleaning cycles. So as bathrooms are now being cleaned in some airports, um, you know, every 15 minutes instead of every hour, we're helping to count users so that instead of just going every 50 minutes, you trigger a cleaning alert every 20 or 30 uh, guests, for example. Another way we help is with contagion maps. So for airports to understand uh, where is there a higher risk of, of transmission to restructure the, the queue layout and make sure they can cope uh, with the regulations and, and limitations of physical distancing. That's Zoe's in a nutshell. If you want to find out more, reach out through zoe's.com or firstname.lastname at zoe's.com after the session. Thanks. Thank you very much, Florian. Uh, moving on to Abby Chaco. Abby is the head of IT commercial and innovation at Gatwick Airport. Uh, Abby has 20 years of experience in aviation sector where he drove many innovations at Gatwick Airport. Uh, not many people know, but Abby is a musician who plays the guitar. Abby, the Zoom stage is all yours. Thank you, Terry. Um, what I would like to do today is to take you through uh, about four examples of uh, innovations uh, which, are, which are going to use uh, uh, IoT um, uh, as part of the solution. So the first one is uh, smart toilet and hand, hand sanitizer dispensers. It's uh, actually a hot topic now across uh, airports because of uh, COVID-19. Um, and, and what we are planning to do is to make sure that the san hand sanitizer dispensers are available uh, after every touch point and it's also monitored uh, across the campus and that's quite essential for us to reassure uh, the passenger. The solution itself is a pretty simple one but it's a, it's a good uh, example uh, to show the use of uh, IoT. Um, another one is uh, uh, bingo boarding and gate instrumentation. Uh, again, in the context of uh, COVID-19, we want to make sure that the boarding uh, process is systematic and uh, transparent and controlled. Uh, also, it, it, you know, we do it in a way that it reduces the passengers crossing over each other or queuing in the uh, jet bridge or the aisle, <clears throat> aisle of the aircraft. So uh, what we have come up with uh, is, is a concept of boarding by seat number. Uh, so the passengers have to wait until their specific uh, seat number is called and then they can approach the gate and go into the uh, aircraft. And we will use patterns in a way that uh, reduces uh, uh, congestion and reduces uh, crossover. Uh, so overall it reduces the risk of uh, infection but also uh, it speeds up the uh, boarding process, uh, you know, so we have done some trials before, before COVID-19 for the purposes of improving the efficiency. Um, and we have, we have found that uh, boarding in, uh, you know, window seats first, back to front is uh, faster than random seat number boarding or random boarding. 
Um, however, for this to work effectively, we need to have, uh, we need to monitor uh, whether there is any queue building up in the jet bridge. And if there is queue building up, we have to slow down the speed of uh, uh, calling these numbers. So that's, that gate instrumentation is quite key for making some of these solutions work in a smooth uh, manner. Uh, that's another example of using IoT. So IoT for gate instrumentation, which will support this sort of a uh, boarding process. Uh, moving on, uh, smart facilities for energy efficiency and maintenance. Uh, again, for a large uh, facility like the airport, uh, it's quite crucial for us to manage our energy consumption in line with utilization, uh, especially since the airport is going through quite a lot of uh, usage changes uh, now and into the future, uh, it's important for us to consume energy and heat up uh, rooms and piers and areas in line with the expected usage. Uh, so that integration of flight operations into actual utilization of uh, uh, facilities and, and uh, heating and, and cooling uh, is quite crucial and, and sensors in this context will really uh, help to ma manage, manage it properly. Um, so, in, in, in addition to that, uh, it is also the sensors are also going to help us in monitoring the facilities across uh, the airport and, and take uh, real time uh, action. So, for example, if a particular uh, gate is faulty, we can make sure that that is not used for uh, flight operations for a period of time. So, we are working on this sort of a digital twin concept which will use quite a lot of uh, IoT sensors uh, as part of the solution. So that's another example of uh, the use of IoT. Uh, the last one is indoor and outdoor tracking. Um, it's uh, crucial for us to ensure that the wheelchairs and similar facilities are available at the right place and we need to know where it is in case we need to uh, recoup those and bring it back to the uh, storage base. Uh, again, sensors uh, or beacons, etc., could be useful in, in implementing that. And the same uh, is also applicable for external, you know, airfield assets like uh, 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 like the the uh, stairs or uh, uh, GSC equipment, charge uh, power, uh, ground power unit, uh, etc. So, especially uh, non-motorized uh, uh, equipment. Uh, would require IoT sensors for us to actually get the location of those things. Some of it can be can come from telematic solution if it's motorized, but if it's not motorized, dollies and staircases, etc., uh, we need to rely on IoT uh, to get the location information. So these are four examples that I wanted to share with you today. Over to you, Itai. Thank you very much, Abi. Um, last but not least, we have Eyal Trichter. Uh, the CEO of Trilogical. Unlike many CEOs, Eyal has over 25 years of experience in research and development. 20 of them were actually spent at Trilogical. His colleagues say he is the most stable thing in the Middle East, uh, perhaps except for Benjamin Netanyahu Eyal. Uh, and as a long distance runner, two years ago he decided to challenge himself and successfully completed his first marathon since then, he completed two more marathons, uh, which makes us feel bad, but luckily there's a global quarantine, so we don't really have to get up the couch. Eyal, please go ahead. Eyal, you're on mute, so I'll unmute you. There you go. Okay, hi, hi, thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Eyal and uh, I will go with a few slides about uh, Trilogical. Trilogical is a kind of IoT uh, company uh, many years before IoT was published as a buzzword. And we develop both uh, hardware and software. Uh, we operate on uh, several sectors, including uh, logistics, airport, railways, and defense. So we have the different capabilities to shift different type of technologies from uh, one segment, one sector to the other in a way that uh, our customers can enjoy from the benefits of uh, different sectors. Um, if I will go a little bit about what we are doing uh, regarding IoT, 
So uh, as, much, as much as it's related to uh, technology, we develop both hardware and software. Uh, we focus on different type of communication because we know that is one of the challenges that uh, companies have uh, to feed the communication uh, bandwidth and, uh, and also the uh, coverage. Uh, we also uh, were requested to uh, develop different type of uh, cyber security modules in order to uh, avoid from unauthorized organization to access the information that we reveal. Uh, we are working a lot uh, around energy management and uh, for the past few years we learned that customers are less and less uh, stopping on uh, monitoring and remote diagnostic, they also want to achieve benefits, real benefits of the products that, that we offer. So in the last two years, we actually uh, went more and more into machine learning and uh, trying to get uh, most of the information that we gather in order to uh, provide a, a, a very good uh, hands to, the, uh, to our customer. Uh, for the airport, we, we focus on the airport side. Uh, we deploy two type of uh, projects. One is the uh, actual product. One is the AMAS, which is uh, Airport Mobile Assets Management. And the second is uh, Bodyguard. Uh, I will speak about that in, in the next two slides. Uh, about uh, AMAS, the uh, AMAS wa wa was developed in order to answer the needs to increase the efficiency at the airport. Uh, what we developed is actually an ecosystem, an integrated system that receives a lot of information from shift management, flight information, uh, display system, information about the equipment uh, status. And our system, uh, in, in a way, actually doing some uh, automatic dispatching of employees to their uh, equipment and also enforce the usage of equipment only by authorized employees using his uh, identity card, meaning that uh, employee that do not have any uh, permission to use the equipment is actually been blocked. So no one needs to monitor the system speak for itself. Uh, by the way, all the keys from the equipment was through on and they were replaced by a button. So, uh, and by doing that, we reduced the traffic at the airport by almost 50% because instead of uh, having uh, six guys, a team, uh, each one of them take uh, uh, its own equipment now it was reduced to only uh, two equipment that can be served uh, at baggage, for example, for the airport. Uh, so we reduce maintenance costs, we reduce uh, accident, uh, and so on. The second, um, the second uh, product is actually uh, regard to safety, uh, following a new uh, regulation that were published by the IATA and the SACO uh, because of using a, a new aircraft from a composite material. Uh, they published a, a new a standard that required uh, the GSE equipment uh, not to touch the, the aircraft in order to prevent any damages. So we developed a, a, a kit that includes a lot of a sensor, very accurate and reliable sensor, a system that know how to control the brakes of, of the uh, GSE and in a way to uh, slow down and block uh, the GSC before it uh, touched the uh, aircraft. Uh, we took that one step forward. So uh, actually the information, the system also produced a lot of information about uh, driver behavior in different situations. So by doing that, we can also start to predict uh, if a, a specific a driver or situation can be more risky than the other. Uh, as a one case study that we had with one of our customer, we, we achieved that for 20,000 uh, uh, flights that were served by equipment fitted by our uh, the, uh, uh, product, uh, there were uh, zero damages recorded in the, in, in, in spite that we know that there are almost uh, $12 billion 
damage, annual damage from uh, aircraft being uh, damaged and uh, overall uh, um, uh, uh, delays. And it's, we know that it's reduced the quality of service that eventually the passengers uh, receive. And uh, of course, it increased the uh, cost of operation. I would like to end with a very short uh, 30 seconds uh, video clip showing that uh, unskilled technician can drive both high loader and passengers uh, up to five seconds. Uh, don't try it at home. We can see here one of our technicians running to the a high loader as the passengers drive by himself, uh, approach the aircraft, uh, it slowed down, uh, it's all automatically of course, uh, until it reach up to two centimeters to the, to the aircraft, in parallel you can drive the other, the other uh, high loader is also equipped with our system. So once he uh, pull out the, uh, the ramp, the system automatically approach the aircraft and in 50 seconds, in 30 seconds, sorry, he actually uh, can uh, f finish the job and maybe to reduce the, the cost for the uh, overall system. So, um, just a minute. So, that, 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 that is the, from my side, Itai. Thank you very much, Eyal. Um... Can you please just unshare the screen so that we will see all the panelists? Yeah. Thank you very much. So we're done with the introductions. Um, let's dive right deep into the discussion. I wanted to start this off with a futuristic sort of visionary question. Um, Abby, hopefully you'll be the first to answer. So let's, let's be optimistic for a second and, and imagine that COVID-19 will eventually be resolved this way or another. And the industry, of course, will change, but IoT implementation will keep on going. So where are we going to in terms of IoT transformation in this industry? And how much time do you think it's going to take? I think there are three areas that uh, would really benefit uh, from, the, from the application of IoT. One is uh, the asset tracking, particularly in the airfield, and making sure that the uh, right assets are at the right place for making the turnaround happen quite quickly. Uh, so that's one. And the second area is gate instrumentation. So this is to uh, make sure that we have got uh, sensing hands and you know the, the eyes and ears uh, on the ground at the gate, but we are able to do that from a remote location, maybe a control room. So the turn operations, as well as communicating with the passengers can actually happen from a remote room as opposed to having people uh, on the ground. So enabling a remote turn is likely to be a, a key theme going forward and, and IoT has a big uh, role to play in that. And the third one is the uh, uh, smart facilities uh, component, which again is about sensing uh, various aspects related to the uh, facility and then adjusting uh, the, the consumption of uh, energy uh, in line with that and also uh, uh, turning on and turning off uh, various facilities based on, uh, based on the expected utilization uh, in the future. Florian, anything to add? Yeah, I think uh, you know, keeping COVID-19 in the back of our minds we uh, airports will have to work hard to win back the trust, especially of leisure travelers, which in some airports make up the, the bulk of, of customers. And those are the people that you need to, the customers you need to convince to, you know, for their ne next vacation, not to drive an hour to the next lake and rent a cottage, but rather, you know, book a trip, drive to the airport, sit inside a, a pressurized metal tube for a couple of hours and expose yourself to some risks. So just like airports have been investing into anything that improves the, the passenger or a lot of things that improve the passenger experience over the couple, last couple of years, now we will see some investments in the area of IoT. Think, for example, of, of anything that enables a contactless uh, journey uh, to, to win the trust back as soon as possible for people to feel safe traveling. Yeah. Um, 
I, I remember a year and a bit ago, I think uh, Florian and Abby and myself, we were in Sunnyvale, one of plug and play selection days. And, and I remember there was a startup company there that developed an autonomous robot to clean toilets in airports. Um, due to the COVID-19 situation, do you see also this kind of solutions? You know, the, the, or will the airport authority find the resources to even deploy this kind of thing? I think I think uh, uh, autonomous robots are going to play a key part in uh, keeping the airport uh, disinfected and clean. So you know we would typically look at uh, the floor scrubbing uh, robots, um, UV uh, disinfection uh, type of robots, as well as the type of flexible robots that we saw in uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, I don't think that solution is productionized yet. I think it is still in a sort of a prototype uh, stage, but there are floor, floor cleaning and uh, UV disinfecting type of uh, robots which are uh, deployed as production systems. Interesting. Eyal, your take on this? Um, actually, even though I'm quite optimistic that this kind of event will pass in, in I don't know, eight months or, or maybe one, one year. I think that in, in the near future, uh, both airport airlines and all the other stakeholders will try to save their costs and to reduce costs by uh, doing some actions to improve their efficiency. I quite agree that the passenger health will be one of the topic, the key topics that uh, both airlines and airports we need to challenge. Uh, I think that in some way, uh, the IoT will go much more to health secure, uh, health monitoring, uh, also uh, in a way to record passengers that will go through the uh, hall from one gate to the other to the airlines in order uh, to have a record that just in case someone will be found uh, sick in the COVID-19, for example, it will be very easy to track all the people that were around him. And in parallel, I'm quite sure that uh, both airline and ground, uh, ground operators and also the airport themselves, uh, we look for the way to be more uh, efficient in a way that they can reduce the cost for operation, maintenance, and uh, even for uh, buying new equipment, for example. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, yeah, let me let me ask you another question. So I, it seems like you know we started from a futuristic perspective, but we're all going down to the to the COVID nineteen crisis. So let's ask the one question no one seems to get tired of in this in this conference: How does the COVID nineteen uh, affected your business? And now that we're talking about you know the future of of how airports will be using IoT, do you plan on pivoting the product? Do you plan on pivoting the the segment of the market that you go for? Um, go ahead, Eyal. Yeah, I'll go ahead and then we'll move to Abby. Hey, Al, please go ahead. Okay, so uh, first I think that like in, in most of the world, we, we, we have the challenge to work for, from home. So the, the first thing that is very obvious, uh, we needed to, to learn uh, as a business, how we can uh, communicate from home. And <coughs> my side, it was not just a technology. It was how to modify or, or uh, fit the organization culture to deal with, the, uh, with this challenge to work from, uh, from home and communicate with our uh, uh, employees and to synchronize between all the different uh, aspects regarding management of a company. But if we go from a, a business perspective, Actually, we were, I think, at the top of uh, one step before uh, many of uh, business opportunities that we work on for the uh, past two years in uh, conferences, exhibition, developing the bodyguard and the AMAS. And uh, I feel that uh, for the next few months, uh, I would say uh, all of those activities will shift to hold or most of them. Uh, so. In, in the eyes of uh, Trilogical, we shift some of the, our activities to new sectors. Uh, one of them, by the way, is uh, more HLS and uh, using some of our experience to connect uh, 
transiological sensors uh, in order to get uh, information about uh, uh, citizens that are under a risk condition. So we shift more, most of our activities to the other sectors, railways and HLS. And we are still waiting for the aviation to come up. Uh, so I think one of, one of your potential customers is here on the screen. Uh, Abby, <laughs> what, what's going on in the airport space? Uh, we, are, we are in a pretty bad uh, state, as you can imagine. So Gavik used to have 800 flights uh, uh, a day. Now we have about uh, eight to 10 flights a day, mostly repatriation flights. So it's almost like the airport is closed. We have reduced our operations to one terminal and that to only for about uh, eight hours or so. Um, so yeah, it's a massive change. A lot of our employees are furloughed. They are sitting at home. Uh, there is a limited uh, crew operating the airport. <clears throat> in terms of the impact on COVID-19, uh, generally for the industry, um, I, I wonder whether there will be an impact on overall passenger traffic even after COVID-19 risk is, uh, risk is uh, mitigated uh, because a lot of people are finding it now or at least we are in a massive training program in terms of how to make things work without meeting people uh, physically through Zoom or other teleconferencing type of uh, technologies. And the impact of this is likely to continue even after that. So do, would we go to Silicon Valley to see the startup pitches or would we just uh, attend their webinar because we are much more used to doing it on uh, these sort of platforms uh, now. So there will be a reduction in uh, uh, corporate travel or, or duty travel um, after this, even after the risk is mitigated. And clearly, the, while the risk is uh, uh, there, which is likely to be one and a half, two years period, the leisure travel will be pretty low uh, and, and the overall industry is going to really, really struggle. So most of the airports will survive one way or the other, but the airlines are, uh, you know, some of the airlines are likely to fail um, because you don't really have the demand uh, of travel to so sustain all the, all the aircrafts and airlines which are out there at the moment. And on, on, another way to look at it is, of course, is, a, is, is, is an adjustment or, or a correction, maybe by the nature, uh, and, uh, you know, it reduces pollution, uh, it reduces traffic on the ground, um, and, and maybe uh, the, 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 the world will adjust a little bit, at least for the next uh, three, four years, uh, and learn from it, uh, uh, from, from the experience. In terms of the initiatives on the ground, the bingo boarding solution that uh, I talked about, that wasn't meant for COVID-19 type of situation, but now we are thinking about using it for that uh, purpose. Yeah, so that's, that's it for me. Okay, thank you. Uh, Florian, I'll, I'll connect this with a question coming from the audience, even though it's not yet the time for questions, but uh, Alexander Vendro Vendorf, who works at Inform, um, is asking whether it's possible to use your solution for, for passenger counting on buses, for example. Okay, sure. To address your initial question, how has it affected us and, and whether we're pivoting, I think it, uh, the past couple of months have taken a couple of expected and unexpected turns. As we work with airports globally, we kind of saw early on what's happening in Asia and then kind of expected this development to, to move from East to West uh, to Middle East Europe and North America. What we So we, we kind of knew that airports would be, you know, delaying maybe some projects or just putting them on hold while they're trying to figure out uh, how quick and is the, the recovery going to, to be. Some, some continued with their project. They said, well, if terminals are uh, more or less empty now, now is the best time to install IoT because you don't need to do it between 2 and 4 a.m. You can do it basically all day, all day long. But what's really interesting is that we don't need to pivot our, our product or our core technology, what we do need to pivot is new use cases that up until two months ago, nobody was talking about. So think of something like uh, fill levels of uh, restaurants or, or shops in airports. That was something an airport operator didn't really look into up until a few weeks ago. And now all of a sudden we see how, you know, shops 
on the high street are allowed to open again, but there are limitations in terms of occupancy and fill level and so on. So we're seeing a lot of the demand for our census there. And now airports are trying to look into the, into the same as well. Once they can reopen again, you know, do they need to have control over their concessionaires, whether the, the limits on number of people in shops are adhered to. Addressing uh, the question from, from the um, audience, uh, can you just repeat it again, please? Yeah, so, so Alex is asking whether it's possible to use your system for people counting on buses, for example. Um, yes, so up until our sensors are being used in, in public transportation, buses and trains, and um, not in airports yet. It's simply airports so far have filled buses to their maximum capacity. I'm sure we've all experienced that. And potentially that's another unexpected use case now if airports are only allowed to fill buses to, you know, 30% capacity. Mm -hmm. Yep, understood. Um, quick, uh, just addressing the audience for a second, in, in a few moments, in a few minutes, we'll go for questions coming from the audience. So uh, there, you have a raise your hand button below the screen. So just press it if you have a question and I'll give you uh, permission to talk by opening your mic so you can ask the question directly. So don't hesitate to press the button and I'll, I'll share the mic with you in a moment. Um, going on for a second. So I think Florian, um, one of the things you said is that you realize what's gonna happen because you're a global company working with airports in Europe, Asia, um, and, and pro pretty much all over the world. Now. This is a question of personal interest to me, but I'm sure many people from the audience share the same interest. You're a relatively small um, technology company. So how do you go about serving the global market of airports? Uh, any insights you can share? Um, yeah, sure. So yeah, we're a relatively small company. There's about uh, 100 so visionaries uh, spread across three offices in the US, uh, Switzerland and, and China. And I think where we add, where we can also add a lot of value besides the product is helping our customers. Most of them are single site operators. There, there are large airport groups that operate multiple airports, but many of them are, are single site operators to kind of take that best practice implementation we've seen elsewhere and bring it to, to other airports, either through a uh, user summit that we organize on a regular basis or by um, very frequent, uh, frequent visits. It is a challenge operating a global business just out of three offices, but it's been a deliberate decision to have, um, you know, no kind of uh, um, completely remote working colleagues because there's a lot of value in having a very close interaction between the sales and the product team to ensure you don't sell anything you can't deliver and vice versa. You know very well what you're actually selling. Gotcha. Um, I think another challenging thing is, you know, the fact that working in airports, um, regardless of a global pandemic, you have many different authorities that may benefit your solution. You know, sometimes you can, you were talking about tracking solutions before, um, the benefits may come to the ground handling company, but also to the airport authority. And so my question is to you, Eyal, how do you go about your business development process? How do you choose the right champion? How do you approach this sales process? Um, actually, it's quite related to Lucky, actually. Uh, it's to find the one uh, in the exhibition or, or the conference. But um, from, from our Lucky or from our perspective, uh, perspective we saw that uh, lastly, more and more airports uh, request from their ground, uh, ground handling operators to support the, the new trends of uh, safety. And by doing that, they are becoming to share the same goals uh, regarding how they wish their ground handlers to operate in, in their yard. And I, I must say that by doing that, they uh, save, save for us a lot of headache. So I instead of trying to convince them that it's required, uh, we can see that it come more and more from uh, the airport uh, themselves. I found that uh, in Europe, in South Africa, that part of the tender for the ground handlers included the, the requirements for safer operation. And after doing that, uh, what, what we did, 
during the last year is to find those benefits that we found out that can be a, a, a key for uh, the organization to decide that they need, they want to equip the, the system. Uh, we found uh, two, two uh, type of uh, uh, topics that uh, we saw that are become more and more major. The first one is to make the operation uh, more effective uh, by reducing the amount of resources uh, that are required in an average per flight. And the second one is to uh, provide more information to customers uh, when it comes to freight uh, and cargo. Uh, we saw that there are a, a lot of gaps that uh, were developed in, in a time between services that were offered to uh, passengers and services that could be supported for, uh, uh, for the business, for the cargo. And lastly, we uh, invest a lot of uh, efforts to provide more data uh, and to share more information between the customers of cargo and uh, uh, the, the, the airlines or the ground handlers in order to increase the, the transform, transparency of information between uh, uh, the customer and the ground handlers or the airlines. Very, very interesting. So um, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but Abby, I'm, I'm specifically interested in your view on this because I think, you know, we're, we're trying to achieve sales for our product here, but your role is more complex. Um, my guess, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that sometimes you may end up choosing, you know, or trialing with, with new solutions where the airport authority is not necessarily the main beneficiary. Uh, one, is that correct to assume? And, and two, what do you evaluate when you try to pick a solution for, for your capacity? Um, that is correct. You know, uh, airport is a, is a mini city. It's, a, it's an ecosystem where you know, hundreds of com companies typically operate. Um, so it's not always uh, the airport which is a beneficiary of the systems or optimizations that you actually make in an airport environment. Uh, what we have done at Gavik is actually create a model where Gavik can actually be the, be the provider of such services and we seek and find innovative solutions on behalf of the airlines and ground handlers. And if, then, if an airline or a ground handler wants to use it, then we uh, enable it for them for a fee. So it works, uh, you know, we treat the uh, airport ecosystem as a small market, and and we are we are a company which is trying to, or my my unit specifically is a unit trying to come up with innovative solutions which can later be commercialized. And we've introduced a number of products uh, like that into the uh, airport ecosystem. Um, it has an advantage in the sense that if you leave the technology evolution to the ground handlers, uh, as an example. Uh, we may never get the right result because they, they are at the bottom of the food chain and their rates are pretty low and they have a very uh, short-term view, three-year or five-year. After that, they are not sure whether they have the contract with the airline for handling the aircrafts. Uh, whereas if the airport makes the investment, whether it's in computer vision or sensors and, and things like that, as long as we can translate that into a pay-as-you-go service, there will be customers to take it. So I am interested in talking with uh, Al on the on the uh, technology that he talked about as long as we can make it work in a commercial uh, commercially meaningful way well i, I want the commission if, if something goes out of <laughs> no problem <laughs> um so uh, last question for me and then we'll go to the audience um and this is also a chance for you if you have some last remarks before the audience asks their question um we're all talking about IoT, this entire panel session is about IoT. And, and you know, we cannot escape the fact that IoT is the internet of things. And things are, are more tangible than software solutions, which may sometimes raise challenges, just like the name of this, of this panel session. So how do you cope with, with trying solutions or deploying solutions that sometimes require real estate or require physical installation? Do you see this? as a problem, a challenge, or, or do you think there's also an opportunity here that doesn't lie in software solutions? Who wants to respond? Are you... I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, 
almost anything and everything that we deploy at the airport will have some physical component, either a camera or AOT and things like that. I don't really see that as a a huge uh, uh, restriction on on trying a new new solution. Uh, particularly, IoT is uh, pretty small. It doesn't take much real estate. It doesn't stick out. Uh, so it's something that that doesn't actually bother us in terms of physical insulation. What is concerned, you know, what makes it difficult for us to use IoT in an airport environment is uh, typically the uh, lack of range in the communication protocol. So, you know, you need to have too many gateways to make it work for, for an airport and it makes it too expensive. And if you make the overall solution more expensive, then the business case doesn't stack up. Uh, so that has been a challenge for uh, terminal as well as a field related uh, IoTs. Florian? You know, there's no doubt there are some challenges associated with getting the thing actually to, to the customer. It needs to be shipped, it needs to be imported, and then it needs to be installed. And yes, there are some challenges around that, but, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's part of business. And I think at the end of the day, uh, once you get a bit of experience, you can uh, navigate, navigate all those challenges. But what I think the advantage is, it allows you potentially to have a much closer relationship with your customer than uh, with a software only solution because it does force you in many cases to go on site and to meet physically and I think that allows you to, to get a much deeper understanding of, of what the customer really wants and, and, and get insights that you automate might, might not if you're remote the whole time. Hey Al, last response from you. I think that uh... Lately, the, the IoT developed a very nice uh, communication uh, uh, architectures or technologies, including the LoRa, the BLE5 or the 5G. Uh, and in those all cases, the coverage was increased and uh, also the regulation uh, keep to uh, support those uh, communication. And I think that when it comes to IoT where the bandwidth is not that required to be a, a wide and it can be with a very few bytes uh, that can be sent from one point to the other covering a, an airport. Uh, some of the challenges regarding uh, real estate become minor and I think that uh, if more and more uh, technology providers uh, such, such as us will adopt those technologies, uh, then I think that we will be able to overcome most of those gaps. And I think that even the prices of those equipment and devices uh, become much more cheaper. Uh, for example, from uh, SLRA 4G, uh, considering to LoRa or BLE. And I think that eventually uh, the IoT uh, perspective, in perspective to communication and real estate that is required or energy consumption uh, going to the right way, and I think that eventually they, we will achieve a win-win situation both for, for the supplier and the customer at the airport. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's time for audience questions, so anyone from the audience who has a question, please either raise your hand or just type it in the Q&A chat box. Um, I'll give a minute or two for people to start asking questions. And in the meantime, there was a question which is not necessarily on IoT, but still pretty inter interesting due to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, someone, an anonymous attendee is asking whether you're going to see a shift in immigration offices from airports and will airports have to adapt to this, you know, to people going abroad um, in order to cut lines, make sure no one is standing close to one another. Abby, what do you think is going to happen there? Yeah, so so I think I think uh, obviously the the uh, social distancing to some extent is going to be uh, implemented in the airport environment as well, but uh, the. The way to address the uh, traffic is probably to use more and more e-gates, but e-gates enable with a touchless uh, interface. So instead of scanning with a physical document on a glass panel, uh, you probably hold the um, 
passport in front of uh, in front of a uh, a camera uh, or or ensure that you're able to read the chip without actually touching the surface you know that's the sort of uh, solution that is likely to come which will enable um, uh, faster processing of uh, people coming into the country you're on mute thank you anyone else wants to share their view Great. Um, I actually had a question coming in through the WhatsApp, uh, gunning for a Florian. And what what people are asking, and by people I mean employees at Hupo that uh, have seen your presentation, um, they're asking, and, and here Sefi just posted it here. Um, oh, that's another question. So two questions from Sefi. One is, do p are people concerned uh, regarding privacy? now that you're installing sensors on, you know, on ceilings in airports and tracking them? Uh, no, I mean, the, uh, I think the benchmark is, is some of the most stringent data regulations in, in Europe uh, that we've coped with because at the end of the day, the sensor looks from top down. So you only see the top of the head, you, ne you don't see a face. Plus, uh, as I mentioned, the, the material never leaves the sensor. So it's immediately transformed into an anonymous bubble. That means also if somebody walks out of sight and back in, we would never know that it's the, it's the same person. Gotcha. Um, and next question, and uh, perhaps Eyal, you can, you can answer this. Do you see any consolidation between different IoT solutions in the airport space? And, and Abby, if you can answer that afterwards, if you have an example perhaps for, you know, how you took two vendors and integrated, or even if it's something you plan on doing, it, it will be interesting. Eyal, please go ahead. Uh, just something that way to my mind. I think that uh, after what Abby said and uh, throwing the presentation, I, I think that if we could uh, synchronize between information from uh, cameras about uh, analyzing the temperature of, uh, of specific uh, passenger, for example, and then tracking that using throwing, uh, I, would call, I would call it some kind of a radar uh, to see that someone that was found out in high temperature, where exactly he pointed in the, in the airport, in order to catch him and not necessarily to have uh, people standing next to the camera, maybe by doing this some kind of synchronization, showing not just the position of, of the person using throwing technology, but also uh, to provide additional information that was captured by the other type of uh, sensors, that could be a perfect, uh, a perfect solution in order to get a very good picture about what's happening in the, in the terminal. Just an idea, Yeah, <laughs> Abby. Okay, um, I think I think there will be consolidation at the data level, meaning uh, data that is coming from various sensors can be consolidated and then used for uh, cross-functional uh, purposes. You know, which could be again uh, uh, a temperature being very low in a particular gate being fed back into the gate allocation system, so that we don't actually use that gate for uh, fly, the next flight, things like that. However, consolidation of the communication protocol and the general IoT platform is unlikely to happen because we tried, we tried I mean, that would have been a great uh, way to deploy something in the airport, a campus-wide IoT network where multiple sensors can all feed into the same sort of network, in which case the gateways can be greatly reduced. This is something that we explored a couple of years back, and what we realized is uh, most of the solution providers, they vertically integrate all the way from sensor communication platform and the application or the use case, and they are unwilling to split that uh, for, for the purposes of you know, consolidating that into uh, a campus-wide IoT. And secondly, there is no strict standard uh, wherein you can just buy a a sensor and everything else that comes out of the sensor can be processed by a, a, a standard standard platform. So because the solutions are vertically integrated, it's likely to be retained as silos and the only possibility being integration of data at a, 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 a data layer, um, which is possible, but not at the, not at the communication protocol IoT layer. 
Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. And, you know, we're seeing it nowadays. But, uh, you know, it could be that in several years, um, and Abby, I think that's the case with Gatwick. Tell me if I'm wrong. You know, just like you said, sometimes you can recommend what kind of solutions. I mean, as long as you use a one-of-a-kind software for the platform to consolidate the data, you can still ask different vendors to connect with it or you are not going to use their solution. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. So it's, it's a case of best in breed. So we would take data from Zovis. We would take data from uh, the, the heat sensing sensors. We might actually take data from passenger flow detection or uh, hand sanitizer uh, level. All of that can be integrated into a, a digital twin or a data platform, which actually uh, can be visualized. Uh, so it's possible to visualize it at that level. And we would like to work with best of breed, you know, best solution for each specific use case. Last question for Florian, um, continuing on that, have you seen the same or do you provide a standalone solution? Our solution can be used as standalone and some airports, especially smaller ones, choose to do so. But uh, I would say the, the, the vast majority of our bigger, more uh, complex airport customers, they use our data in one way or another in, in other solutions. And for that, you need to have your, your APIs ready uh, so that data can be extracted, even to the extent that maybe our, our dashboard is not used directly anymore, but the data is instead consumed elsewhere. So there, I think, as a as a small young tech company, you just have to be very flexible. Yeah, I agree. Um, guys, we're running out of time. I wanted to take the last minute to thank you, the panelists, for joining. Thank you very much. We know it's, it's evening uh, Europe time. And thank you, the audience, for joining in and sharing your questions. Um, since this is a Zoom conference and not uh, a live and physical one, you cannot really see anyone and hear them clapping their hands. So those of you who haven't raised their hands for questions, please raise your hand as a way to show your appreciation to the panelists. Thank you very much. We're already seeing a raise of hands from everyone. Um, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And thank you guys for joining in. Thank Bye you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Itai. Bye-bye.